Oh, hi, I'm the heretic. Prager U brought on Sheriff David Clark to lie to us about how cops are the good guys in the United States. He downplays the existence of abusive police and lies about several high-profile cases such as with Eric Garner and Freddie Gray. What we learned from the part one of my reply is that police are trained to prioritize their life over all others and never to hesitate, ever, if there is a threat, while at the same time viewing ordinary people as enemy combatants. That although police do not create unjust legislation, they enforce unjust legislation, and when an innocent person is victimized by police, it's our fault for not complying hard enough. Even though whether or not we're complying, or even breaking legislation, is entirely up to an officer's subjective opinion. At this point, I've proven to any reasonable person that cops are not the good guys. They're a roaming band of thugs. Furthermore, Sheriff Clark doesn't say anything else of note in the Prager U video. So, I'm done, right? There's nothing more to say? Well, it's said that police enforce laws. So what are laws? Laws are principles in factual situations usually invoked to solve disputes, discovered over time by judges operating in a more or less decentralized fashion. This is what used to be known as English common law, Roman law, and merchant's law. Disputes were resolved based on who can objectively prove right and wrong. Rulings can only be made when two parties come to them with a dispute, and almost always, the rulings only apply to the parties in question, who agreed in the first place to abide by the decision. Regardless, the discovery process, developed over thousands of years, suggests the existence of objective rules that are completely knowable. Laws, therefore, are objective a priori entities that are learnable through discovery, such as the laws of mathematics or laws of physics. Now, government legislation did exist, but at the time, they were known as statutes or decrees. Nobody would have ever called it law. We understand common law today as deontological ethics, ideas such as self-ownership and the non-aggression principle. How theft is a claim to the ownership of another person's labor, which is slavery, by the way. I have a whole video going into more detail about that, so I won't get into it here. But the important part is this. Rights are derived from self-ownership and exist only in a negative sense, informing us of what we cannot do rather than what we ought to do. Of course, this brings up the question of enforcement. Negative rights require no enforcement, since all actors are passive, and getting a passive party to justify their inaction is no different than asking someone to prove a negative. You can't do it. Enforcement is defined as the act of compelling behavior to the enforcer's preference. You can't compel negative behavior. I mean, you can coerce someone to not do something, but compelling someone to a state of inaction is impossible, since someone is always doing something. You, dear viewer, are watching this video, for example. Contrast positive rights. A common argument is that people have a right to health care as one example of positive rights. If so, then not providing health care to someone would be immoral. There are millions of things that anyone could be doing at any point that aren't providing health care to someone. When inaction means non-compliance, enforcement to compel behavior is required. When being moral is impossible, then the principle is invalid. At no point would positive rights ever be considered to be law the passive party is required to justify their inaction under a paradigm of positive rights, and the argument is therefore invalid. No court with any concern for right or wrong would disagree with this. Now, do the police in the United States enforce laws? No, they enforce legislation. And legislation is when rules are determined by legislators, and when rules are determined by legislation, it is not bound by precedent or limited to what parties would voluntarily consent to. Without the ability for people to freely disassociate from the legislators, they lack 
the crucial feedback mechanism that their legislation is even socially necessary. Legislation just becomes opinions, given the stamp of approval by majority vote, subject to change at literally any minute. People are manipulated into believing this form of societal central planning can somehow be considered to be law. If this is too abstract or hard to follow, don't worry, I'll explain it simply. Law is universal and unchanging. Legislation is subjective and arbitrary. If police enforced law, they would have arrested everyone in the government centuries ago. But they don't, because police in the U.S. enforce legislation. Because of the arbitrary nature of legislation, no person in the U.S. could possibly know the full extent of the law, especially when they're constantly being added to and modified. 527 pages were added to the Federal Register on July 12, 2019, in one day. The idea that anyone would be in compliance with all of those rules is ludicrous. The real trouble is that anyone doing their best to follow legislation has to know the 0.01% of the rules that apply to them. But in order to do their job, the police have to know all of it, and how it applies to everybody. They can't, even though it's their job to. Thus, whether or not you're violating legislation is the opinion of any police officer and their fragmentary understanding of it. At least in High and V, North Carolina, the U.S. government admits that the law is arbitrary. But the fun thing about arbitrary rules? You can selectively enforce them in your favor. We can see this with police. Between 2005 and 2015, despite roughly 1,000 people every one of those years being killed by police, only 13 officers were convicted of murder or manslaughter. For every 1,000 killings, that's 1.3 convictions. Even if you want to argue that some of those killings were justified, hell, let's be generous and say 90% of those killings are in self-defense, that's still a 1.3% conviction rating for unjustified killings. I don't actually have the numbers for self-defense cases, but the shockingly low conviction rate should be damning enough. Since 2015, police have killed more people than so-called mass shooters by as much as 1,200 and 80%. 1,164 people were killed by police in 2018. According to the U.S. Department of Justice's Uniform Crime Reporting Program, there are slightly above 750,000 sworn officers in 2012. I'm discounting non-sworn because these guys are basically civilian support staff. And although the numbers are six years out of date, I'm going to assume it's more or less accurate to 2018 numbers. Using these numbers, police alone have a murder rate of 155.2 murders per 100,000 officers. The United States has a homicide rate of 5.35 per 100,000 citizens. Venezuela's is at 56.33 per 100,000 citizens. According to the 2010 census, there were 39,310,817 African Americans in the U.S. If you adjust the number of police officers to that number, the amount of fatal shootings in the U.S. would go up by 61,010. This dwarfs the number of gun deaths cited each year by anti-property rights gun grabbers, which even then is inflated by counting things like suicides. This isn't a problem of some police officers, like the one mentioned by name in the last video. It's a pandemic. Police officers are the single most violent and murderous demographic in the United States by a huge margin. In the book Police Domestic Violence, Handbook for Victims, the author Diane Wentendorf cites several studies showing a rate of domestic violence among police officers as high as 40%. Which makes sense. I mean, what are victims going to do after all? Call the police? How absurd is it that the very authorities meant to stop or prevent this abuse are the abusers? But surely there are other state agencies that can deal with these problems, right? The trouble is that they all rely on each other. 
not just in the sense of a common state interest either. Prosecutors rely on police to bring them cases, and as such, will be reluctant to try an offending officer in court, or will be more likely to accept a sweetheart plea deal. Police officers rely on each other professionally, and many higher or lower agencies draw ranks from among each other. The conviction rate of police officers should be all the evidence needed to show their insular, closed system. The conflict of interest in having a state employee convicting another state employee of wrongdoing should be obvious. The police department might put on a phony investigation, which will ultimately argue that the officer shot the man crawling on his hands and knees, begging for his life, did nothing wrong. But if there's a big public outcry, then maybe, just maybe, the state is willing to fire a murderer from their department, only to rehire them back onto the force so he can retire, claiming to have gotten PTSD from his execution of an innocent father. All so he can earn $2,500 a month in stolen taxpayer money for the rest of his life for doing nothing. And for those of you who don't know, PTSD is a mental health condition. The acronym stands for Giant F***ing Murder Boner. And then we have an unnamed New York Police Department officer who ran over a bicyclist for his own safety. New Orleans Police violently tackled a man to the ground for playing a trumpet on the street in New Orleans, a city where that kind of stuff is common. A 14-year-old rape victim was tied up and then raped again, this time by LAPD sex crimes detective Neil David Kimball, who pled guilty to these charges. It's no wonder this kind of crap happens. It's the logical conclusion of incentives created by the state. You give a small group of people a monopoly to decide who breaks rules, why are you surprised when they tell you that their own don't break any rules? Why are you surprised that this immunity of consequences has made them the most dangerous and bloodthirsty demographic in the U.S. by a huge margin? Sociopaths are attracted to positions of authority where they can inflict their antipathy without repercussion. What other kind of person would carry out the government order to evict a disabled veteran from their home over $236 in money the state illegitimately claims. Who else would plant meth in people's cars during routine traffic stops just to get arrests? Who else would break into people's homes and throw fathers into cages for smoking a plant? Perhaps even more insidious is when governments demand police victimize people by mandating arrest quotas. Failure to meet a certain number of traffic tickets issued, criminal arrests, or any other police activity that results in the parting of you from your hard-earned money and freedom per month could result in police officers being punished, which could be anything from negative peer pressure to reassignment, pay cuts, suspension, or even firing. All because court fines and ticketing accounts for 21.1% of revenue on average for state and local governments, with some localities reaching as high as 80%. And that's not even getting into civil asset forfeiture, where if a police officer determines that your property might have been involved in a crime, they can take it. The victim doesn't even have to be charged with a crime, and the onus is on the victim to prove that their property wasn't involved in a crime. The police are asking you to prove that you weren't involved at your own expense just to get your property back. Whatever happened to innocent until proven guilty? But that's not the standard anymore, because retired murderers need their free government cheese. States and localities are hurting for money. Of course they'll turn to legislation enforcement as a revenue stream. For the cops, hell, for the whole department who refused to go along with this extortion, they're simply fired. The whole department. How weird is it that the town of Ridgetop, Tennessee doesn't have cops and they haven't fallen into utter chaos? Almost as if this whole thin blue line stuff standing between us and the criminals is utter nonsense, especially since that the thin blue line are the criminals. How can I make it more clear that the state does not work in your interest when their criminal enforcers are legislatively obligated to steal from you and are given qualified immunity 
if you happen to be injured or killed in the prosecution of their duty. Like when Michael Vick, excuse me, Vickers, a Coffey County, Georgia police officer, chased a fugitive into a family's yard, held children at gunpoint, attempted to shoot their dog twice, missed both times, and hit one of the kids in the leg. The case was thrown out. The family will receive no compensation from the trauma the state inflicted on them and the hospital bills. Qualified immunity guarantees a criminal officer cannot be subject to lawsuits for violating someone's rights. The argument in favor of qualified immunity is that it protects legislation enforcers and government workers from frivolous lawsuits. But I think you can see that not every lawsuit is frivolous. Like that lawsuit against a daycare worker by a four-year-old's mother accusing the government employee of strip-searching and photographing her daughter. Nope. Qualified immunity. Now let's talk about police shooting dogs. I think the way Radley Balco put it in the Washington Post, In too much of policing today, officer safety has become the highest priority. It trumps the rights and safety of suspects. It trumps the rights and safety of bystanders. It's so important, in fact, that an officer's subjective fear of a minor wound from a dog bite is enough to justify using potentially lethal force. In this case, at the expense of a four-year-old girl. And this isn't the first time. In January, an Iowa cop shot and killed a woman by mistake while trying to kill her dog. Other cops have shot other kids, other bystanders, their partners, their supervisors, and even themselves when firing their guns at a dog. That mindset is then, of course, all the more problematic when it comes to using force against people. The Department of Justice estimates that 25 dogs a day are killed by police. However, the Puppy Side Database Project, which has done its best to gather statistics, as the government does not, estimates that as many as 500 dogs are killed by police every single day. That's as many as a dog killed every three minutes. Meaning by the time you've heard this sentence, several dogs have been killed by police somewhere in America since the start of this video. Remember how police are trained? They are trained to never hesitate, always shoot first, and neutralize the target immediately. This means killing a 14-month-old Labrador Golden Retriever mix secured by a leash. A SWAT team killing a town mayor's 7-year-old and 4-year-old dogs after searching the wrong house for substances the state arbitrarily deemed illegal. The mayor himself was also shot four times, but luckily survived. A four-year-old pit bull was killed by a SWAT team, which came to the house to see if the family had electricity and natural gas. Arkansas Sheriff Keenan Wallace shot and killed a chihuahua for barking aggressively. San Antonio police shot and killed Trixie, another chihuahua, despite her being on the other side of a fence, literally not a threat to police officers whatsoever fully grown adult human, trained and equipped for the worst case scenario when it comes to violence, sees a tiny dog as a threat. This hyper paranoia tricks them into thinking a five pound chihuahua is a threat. Though when one out of five cases, hatchlings are either around or in the line of fire of a police shooting a dog, well, we should all be worried. This is a flagrant violation of the four cardinal rules of gun safety. The second rule Never point the gun at something you are not prepared to destroy. And the third rule, always be sure of your target and what's behind it. Police are trained to not only prioritize their safety, but to place themselves and their well-being above the people they are supposed to protect. Rather than protectors and peacekeepers, they're gunmen, soldiers. Actually, no, because that's an insult to those serving in government militaries. Stephen Mater was an Afghan war veteran who joined a West Virginia police department. Mater had a confrontation with a man with a gun, who he noticed was trying to commit suicide by cop. Rather than shoot him, Mater tried to talk him down. When backup arrived, they just shot and killed him, after the 911 dispatcher was informed that the gun was not loaded and that the guy was probably trying to commit suicide by cop. Though the dispatcher did not communicate this with the other officers. For his caution, sense, and trigger discipline, Mater was fired from the police department. All a cop has to do to exonerate themselves from any criminal liability is to claim a reasonable threat to their safety or to say the magic words 
Stop resisting. And besides, it's not like police dogs are safe from the threat of officers either, who will be as cruel to them as they will be to you. But don't you dare touch a police dog. Are these the actions of someone who's sworn to serve and protect? Would you tolerate a man in your community who did half of the things I described and claimed they were necessary for your safety? But then why do we accept it when they call themselves police officers? What do you think about these people being just as powerful, just as strong, and just as well-funded as the U.S. military? The mainstream media in Hollywood, which are controlled by the state, pushes forward narratives of heroic cops putting their lives on the line to stop criminals. But what cops enforce isn't law, it's legislation. And legislation means the rules are whatever any state agent says they are. Cops are trained to never hesitate, to always pull the trigger first, and because they are state actors, legislation does not apply to them. They will kill, steal, and rape. And the only reason they would stop you from doing those things is because, well, the government's a monopoly and you're the competition. I don't know what kind of sick joke statists try to pull when they say that cops are just here to keep us safe. But I heard it before, and it wasn't funny the first time. Our freedom was traded for safety against our will, and we lost both and gained neither. Look, I want law and order too, but if this is what law is, then I'll take my chances with chaos, thank you. In a stateless voluntary society... There would be no centralized bureaucracy or monopoly on arbitration that would shield security agents from liability. They would be accountable to their customers and required to pay any damages to private property they can be proven to have caused. Since hyper-aggressive belligerents make security agents prone to liability, they'll be trained in de-escalation techniques and non-lethal subdual. They'll likely still be armed because the worst-case scenario can still happen, but it will be the absolute last resort, rather than their go-to method or threat neutralization, or simply because they want overtime hours. A belligerent militant is a liability for any private security company. And because there's no state, and we have a system of common law again, in other words, actual law, victimless crimes won't be a problem. This will mean less recidivism, less crime. Private security, being liable and accountable for their actions, will respect those they're supposed to protect. Any cops that can be loosely characterized as good has an interest in seeing the collapse of the state, since they will be better paid for their expertise in the private sector. The trouble is that what we have is institutionalized chaos. Arbitrary rules, where anyone can be arrested for anything at any moment, and the police are judge, jury, and executioner. The purpose of legislation is for the state to exempt themselves from following the rules of society, and no group exemplifies this more than the government enforcers called police. Look, the problem starts at the academy. New cadets are indoctrinated with a military mentality. With them as the soldiers and us as the people that battle. We're either collateral damage or combat fatalities. Either way, the reality is that it's not going to stop. Cause this is what happens when you call the cops. For people who are still under the mistaken impression that the state serves their interests, fearing the chaos and uncertainty of a free, voluntary society, well, what have you got to lose? Questions? Comments? Critique? Did you learn anything? How would you feel if I told you that most of the examples of badge abuse I cited in this video happened between this recording and my previous video? Leave a comment below. Support me on Patreon. Like. Share and subscribe to become a heretic today.